Okay, it's November 30th, 2021. This is the World Forest Report with Dean Bell and Dean Kevin. And today I'm going to finish up the documentary, The Dimming by geoengineering.watch, geoengineeringwatch.org. Uh, Dane Wigington put it out a year or two ago. In the East and in the West, Large forest land areas have been sprayed to kill destructive insects. This work by airplanes is significant. It has an indirect effect on all Americans. Here's one to keep track of over here. Notice it didn't have yeah. anything coming out of it. Yeah, he just turned on. He just turned on his spray. With commercial airlines, you're not gonna get this kind of converging intersection, I'm even though they're at different altitudes. But the important thing to consider, there's not a natural cloud in the sky. Everything in the sky is an aerosol out of the back of an aircraft. Anybody who says that can't affect the weather is, is simply ignoring logic and reality. My rock climber's mentality says you have to face reality. You just have to face reality. Or if you don't, you could end up at the bottom of a cliff because gravity will take you there. When I see El Capitan over there looming in the distance, and I think about the times, I feel what this place has given me is so much as a human being to experience life. You can't not care. You have to care about it. You can't not care. You can't not I care. That is same. that is not human. That's a human who's been conditioned to no longer be a human being. With all the spray that's been up put up in our atmosphere, it's, it apparently has come down and it's affecting the environment. You see all the trees that are dead and in the process of dying right now, flashing out. And you can see the, the really brown ones that have just flashed out with the needle still on them. And it's progressing throughout the whole hillside. Even on the top slope, if you, if you look to the back slope up there, I mean, they're flashing out everywhere. Yeah, that's right. You don't have any kind of uniform green. You have just various colors of dead yeah. and dying. That's all you have. What a thought that we're standing here at this point in history, dealing with this madness. Maybe two years from now, we won't even be able to stand here. It's been proven this is happening throughout this country and around the world. This is supposed to be Yosemite, and a national treasure, world heritage site. You want to take a picture? What are you going to see? Climate engineering operations are saturating our atmosphere with light scattering particles that alters the light spectrum that reaches the surface of the planet. This in turn affects photosynthesis. The sunlight that is going through this layer piggybacks the frequency of those toxins. When you're exposed to the sun, when there is that gray halo between you and the sun, the sunlight burns and it feels very, very unpleasant, and you end up feeling miserable at the end of the day. Whereas when the sun goes through a clear blue sky, you may get a sunburn if you stay there too long, but it's a pleasant warmth that you're getting. We've been told that the ozone layer is recovering, but that's a blatant lie. That's a cover-up. We're being bombarded with very dangerous levels of UV radiation, not just UVA and UVB, but UVC, the last spectrum of UV radiation before X-ray. So if we have 10.5 milliwatts per centimeter squared and we subtract the UVA, which I believe was 4.3 milliwatts per centimeter squared, we end up with about 60% of the total incoming UV is UVB. And that's simply off the charts. It is well known and understood in the science community that climate engineering operations would damage the ozone layer. But because the science community is betraying the human race and the entire web of life, they are not admitting that these operations have long since been deployed and are destroying the ozone layer. And when people feel how intense the sun feels in their skin, it is not their imagination. Extreme UV radiation is killing plankton. Plankton populations globally are plummeting. At this point in time, plankton is the single largest oxygen producer on the planet. No plankton, no people. Climate engineering from every conceivable direction is pounding the nails into our collective coffins. In order to try to understand what was going on with the bombardment of nanoparticles, I decided to test lichens. Now, environmentally, lichens only get their nutrients and energy from the air and from rain. I tested and found that the most common uh, element uh, found was aluminum. There are a number of things that happen with aluminum saturation. And rather than acidic, it creates a, a basic formula in the soil which favors some plants and destroys others. 
In root systems, it can have a significant impact on their absorption and nutrient uptake. The pH of the rain is 10 times more alkaline than it used to. The pH of the soil is 10 times more alkaline than it used to. For acid soils, they've gone neutral. It hasn't gone much past neutral, but it's still 10 times more alkaline than it should be. The soil has been the most destructed entity on the planet. We know that the soil contains tens of thousands of different species of microbes, bacteria, fungi, helminth, viruses, that are absolutely essential for the soil to produce food that actually nurtures us. A lot of work has been done on tobacco and wheat and rye grasses, that germination of seeds in the presence of nanomaterials, of aluminum oxide, for instance, significantly stunts root growth and leads to a plant that has been compromised. Most of the oxygen that's being produced by our planet is produced by things like trees and algae and cyanobacteria. All of these life forms are negatively impacted by exposure to nanoparticles of aluminum oxide and other nanomaterials. You see smaller plants in front with the very discolored leaves. That's fungal infection. As the bioavailable metals are killing soil microbes, changing soil pHs, changing forest soil compositions, it has a horrific domino effect. Whole specimens, mature specimens of manzanita flash out stone dead black from fungal infection. In the geoengineering mix, you know, these are nanoplastic particles that are spiked with aluminum, with titanium, with strontium. Basically, the oceans are covered with a sheet of plastic. The oceans can no longer evaporate the water that the atmosphere needs to keep the earth blue and green like it used to be. The algae in the ocean depend on a lot of sunlight in order to produce oxygen. And they can't do their job anymore because they're not getting the light they need. In the last two or three years, ever increasing articles about nanoplastics appearing in chicken, in fruit, in vegetables, and also in our human body. Every animal that we eat now is full of these nanoplastic particles. And these are certainly not animals that have swum in the ocean. <laughs> these are land-based animals. They never eat in a plastic bag, and yet they're accumulating these nanoparticles. And the only possible source of that is the air that they breathe. At this late hour on our planet, when we most need alternative forms of energy, climate engineering is dramatically diminishing all three primary forms of alternative energy. Climate engineering is disrupting the hydrological cycle, i.e. the rain cycle, causing protracted droughts all over the world, which is dramatically reducing hydropower production. Climate engineering, by its very description, solar radiation management to block the sun, greatly diminishes solar power output all over the world. Climate engineering also reduces wind power because it reduces convection. Atmospheric layers of reflective particles reduce convection, which in turn reduces wind, which reduces evaporation, again decreasing potential power output for all other forms of energy. Many are absolutely overwhelmed when they are introduced to the climate engineering issue. They try to convince themselves that our government would never do this to us. But such a conclusion doesn't hold up to available data. All official air testing agencies generally test for 10 microns, 2.5 microns at best. Atmospheric testing has proven that climate engineering aerosols are unimaginably smaller in the 20 to 100 nanometer range. The smaller the particle, the more deadly it is to inhale. Available science studies prove that human hearts and human brains now have not just millions, but billions of nanoparticles lodged in them. Most know that bee colonies are collapsing. What most don't know is that insect populations in general are also collapsing all over the world. Bees are dying of symptoms resembling Alzheimer's and dementia in human beings because they're packed full of aluminum. Why aren't the beekeepers acknowledging this? Why isn't this fact a headline all over the globe? 
To suit our convenience, we clear other large areas of natural life in order to build towns and cities. Our homes, stores, and factories clustered closely together are easy marks continually tempting invasion by the insect enemies. Our only answer is to wage constant battle with the bugs. This must be intelligent, organized, well-planned warfare. We must fight our insect enemies with every weapon our imagination and science can devise. Chemical warfare is quick death to our enemies whether used on a small scale or on a large scale. Vast areas can be treated in a short time, an outstanding advantage in our warfare against the insects. What's it like for an insect to be poisoned by a crop-dusting aircraft? Don't we all know? Is there any difference whatsoever between crop-dusting insects and the global climate engineering spray operations that have long since contaminated our entire planet and every breath we take? How can we avoid this? answer we can't you can make very high quality and do this in just a jet in a very simple way make high quality alumina particles just by spraying alumina vapor out which oxidizes and implementation decisions will be risk to risk decisions the risk of doing it against the risk of not doing it it's very good to have research on new applications of technology that are beneficial but it should be balanced at the same time it's developed with the study of the adverse effects, if there are any. Now, as it happens, the Air Force conducted a study starting in 1993. It was called In Vitro Toxicity of Aluminum Nanoparticles in Rat Alveolar Macrophages. That's a real fancy way of saying testing the effect of aluminum nanoparticles on the white blood cells in the little air sacs in your lung, the alveoli. And what they found in this eight-year study was that these particles, when you're exposed to them long enough, it suppresses the ability of your white blood cells to defend you from airborne infections coming into your lungs. And so essentially by breathing this material in, your immune system is dramatically suppressed. If we can't breathe, if we can't inhale without sucking up highly toxic, bioavailable, bioaccumulative particulates that lodge in our systems like a plaque, Elements like aluminum, barium, strontium, elements that are highly toxic in and of themselves, but when combined, become exponentially more toxic. 70% of the nanoparticles that are already within us are introduced to our systems through just respiration. So we breathe them into our nose, the ethmoidal sinuses then collect them, they can migrate to our frontal lobe through the olfactory nerve, and there they can generate reactive oxygen species and cause brain damages of different type. Everything we know at present suggests that generation of reactive oxygen species is the cause of aging, cause of almost every disease that we know. Certainly dementia, but, but other diseases as well. A lot of the nanoparticles, not all of them, but a lot of them have metal ions Metal ions are potent generators of reactive oxygen species. When you have nanoparticles in the body, they are small enough so they go everywhere. There is no barrier to them in any part of the body. They cross the blood-brain barrier, they cross cell membranes. They're even more reactive or can be more damaging than virus particles. We have natural defenses against viruses. We have no natural defenses against nanomaterials. And again, they never leave our system. They don't die. They're not cleared. We don't produce antibodies against them. So we are exposing humanity to a class of materials that will continue to damage biological tissue for the lifetime of that organism. The Japanese developed a blood washing method called aphoresis that was used for reducing cholesterol and fats from the blood. And then a brilliant German toxicologist came along and modified this procedure where he could not only wash out the blood, but also the plasma from the connective tissue, which is a much deeper look into the system. The entire blood volume and plasma volume is put through a filter system several times and filters out anything that's toxic. And with this method, it's the first time you can actually measure body burden, or how much is in the entire body. And as it turns out, nanonized aluminum 
is by a factor of roughly 100 times, 94 to 120 times more prevalent than any other toxin, nanonized aluminum. And we know that we absorb aluminum very poorly by eating it. That cannot be the possible route how we get toxic. The only way that we can get these high levels of aluminum is through inhalation or through injection. This was a, a big wake-up call. To let the involvement of a program impact my grandchildren, my even my children, not necessarily the immediate years for myself, is a very personal concern to know how it will flow down through the elements of the family. I often find that those who question actions of the government often don't want to get involved until it directly affects them. If you look up into the sky, this is directly affecting you. If you have a family, your children, your wife, your husband, your extended family members, your animals, this is directly affecting all of us. How can so many claim that governments and militaries around the world would not spray chemical and biological agents on populations when there are, are literally hundreds of historically documented cases of such operations occurring in recent decades? Many biological warfare experiments were officially used to test the range and dispersal patterns of aerosol, particulates, and biological agents. In the United States alone, by 1977, 239 open-air biological tests had been conducted over unknowing U.S. populations. Tests were conducted throughout the 20th century, many of which took place concurrently with the covert ramp-up of climate engineering operations. We are expected to believe that this experimentation was benign and not connected to the climate engineering operations, just as is the case with the ever-increasing exposure to microwave transmissions all over the world. Many of what we are told are only cellular communication towers have power supply inputs that are 10 times larger than what is needed for communications purposes. The compounding synergistic toxicity of these operations is accumulating inside all of us. What makes us sensitive to Wi-Fi and to the electromagnetic radiation in general is the metals in our body. And we never used to have aluminum in our mitochondria. The aluminum in our mitochondria makes the inside of the mitochondria resonant with Wi-Fi and they start heating up and it starts destroying the mitochondrial DNA at a very, very rapid rate. And so it's really the synergy of the metals dispersed in our body and the Wi-Fi making our body a resonant antenna with the Wi-Fi environment. And of course, you, you know, we're going now from 3 or 4G to 5G with the ever increasing amplitude of energy that's delivered into our systems. This is one of those life or death choices. But we're not just talking about my life or your life. We're talking about something that is killing the fundamental living system on the planet. We are bathed now in a soup that is comprised of nanonized aluminum. Glyphosate forms six different salts with aluminum and works as a carrier to carry the aluminum deep into our brains. And uh, the only other missing thing there was to open the cell walls, open the blood-brain barrier, is the ever-increasing exposure to radio waves. Half of the people listening to this talk will die with or off dementia. And the main cause of dementia is the nanonized aluminum particles. There is somebody behind the scene orchestrating that with the perfect understanding of the human condition and of toxicology and brought the three things together that will in a very very rapid period of time we're talking six seven years from here on cause major destruction of the human nervous system that could be stopped at a switch we could have a clean world tomorrow
we need to come together for all of humanity to address this issue. And I think that the only way to do that at this point is a legal approach and to present all evidence on both sides, the evidence that we are collecting as independent scientists and the evidence that already exists in those laboratories where these materials are produced and deployed. Colleagues of mine, they don't really accept this yet. They're starting to because I've shared some of the data that we've collected, but most of them will ignore it and, and do call it beat up conspiracy theories. Well, those learned people are ignorant of the facts. And so my call to action is don't ignore things anymore. You know, we have to address this issue. It's, it's in, on our doorstep, it's in our skies, it's in our children. We have to do something. If the ongoing global climate engineering weather warfare operations are not brought to light and to a halt, allowing the planet to respond to the damage done, it will never be able to find a new equilibrium, an equilibrium that may yet allow it to sustain life into the future. Exposing and halting climate engineering operations is the great imperative. They are disrupting virtually the entire web of life. I think we need to enlist the uh, support of uh, commercial airline pilots as well as calling back and bringing these subjects up with our House and Senate members in the U.S. Congress. I think it's going to take that kind of action to uh, get this geoengineering exposed, find out what's behind it and why they are doing this. In my life, I have friends, family, wonderful people who are trying to stay within the official reality on the theory that they'll be safer. And the reality is, if you look at where this thing is going, you know, better we deal with it now, it's like cancer, it's only gonna get worse. The data is what's gonna change people's mind. So you need to be able to draw it out, get the reports available, and get publicity on what the conclusions are so that people believe it. It's not just someone raising a subject that has no validity, it's based on scientific data that demands changes. We've gotten to the point where the mystery is so expensive, spiritually, psychologically, financially, legally, you know, that the time has come to say is, you know, who's really doing this and why are they behaving this way? And I often wonder, do any of those people, you know, behind the scenes fearing reprisal, are they looking into this? There is data out there. Who's gonna bring it forward? We are rapidly running out of time to take care of this problem. That's what makes it so critical. Yeah, and I can only hope that in my lifetime, we'll have a resolution of this and we can fix it. I'd really like to see the planet stay, the life on the planet stay anyway. How do we stop climate engineering? I'm asked this question so often. The only way forward in this fight, the only way we can expose and halt climate engineering is from the inside out. With a critical mass of awareness, a level of awareness so vast that it causes a shockwave around the world so that populations all over the world know what their governments have done to them without their knowledge or consent. A level of awareness so vast that our military brothers and sisters and their families understand what they are really a part of, literally self-extermination. We must reach a critical mass of awareness. It is the only way we can expose and halt climate engineering processes, and this effort will take all of us. You cannot change anything when you are dead. When you are dead, it's always gone. So as long as you are alive, do something, I would say. I do trust human ingenuity and human intelligence. And I think we still have a chance, but things are far more serious than the general public is aware of. The song is going to be over very soon if you don't turn things around. We have a system full of great pain and great suffering and great poverty. And, you know, people sort of walking around in the dark playing bump bumper cars, it doesn't have to be. And so part of what has me so optimistic is I know what's possible. I know that what we have now is, is tiny compared to what's possible. So now's the time to figure out what's going on and why. Now, our only chance 
is to stop interfering with Earth's life support systems, to expose and halt climate engineering once and for all, allow the planet to respond to the damage done to it on its own. Climate engineering is not a cure. Climate engineering is a curse, even worse than the disease it claims to treat. Time is not on our side. The sand in the hourglass is running out at blinding speed. Please, make your voice heard. Make every day count. Please forgive me if I ran for a moment on the memories from my former life, my life before the last 20 years of my desperate attempt to sound the alarm. I spent so much time on or near the ocean. I got my scuba certification at age 14. Being below the waves was always an escape to another world, a world that still made sense, a world in which I often felt I wanted to remain. And I feel so fortunate to have seen and experienced life below the surface of the sea in numerous parts of the world, in the waters off New Zealand, Australia, in the South Seas, Fiji, the most remote locations in the Sea of Cortez, the Gulf of California. But the vast majority of my diving sabbaticals were around all the shores of the Channel Islands off the coast of California. And how incredibly miraculous and thriving were the once expansive kelp forests there. I would meander in total solitude through these mystical undersea landscapes that were teeming with life. When the water clarity was at its best, the visibility could be well over 100 feet. And on such days, stunningly beautiful beams of sunlight would glisten down through the kelp stalks rising up from so far below me. It was like being in the canopy of a long lost medieval forest. And weaving my way through the massive kelp stalks in total silence, I felt like a wild and free bird flying through an untouched and unspoiled paradise of unimaginable beauty. So many species all playing their individual part in the miraculous web of life. Seals making their way through the kelp would often alter their course and they would swim up to me and stare right into my mask, directly into my eyes. They were curious. Many of my memories from the kelp forests now seem a very distant dream from another life. Moments that I knew, even while they were occurring, were slipping away. It was beautiful. It was nature. A part of the living ocean. A part of the web of life on which our lives depend. I had to leave that life. There was a constant calling of conscience inside me. I felt there was much I had to do, that there was a long journey before me yet to be traveled. The deepest and most untraveled wilderness has always been my sanctuary. And when I trek there alone and in solitude, I feel most connected to the whole. I marvel at the complexity and the miraculousness of life, the countless forms of it. I try to contemplate the endless and seemingly impossible factors that were necessary for life to exist and flourish on this spinning ball of rock in the harsh and hostile environment of space. A ball of rock with its own magnetic shield, with its own moon that stabilizes its orbit, that orbits a life-giving star at just the right distance with miraculous atmospheric layers that for unimaginably long spans of time have facilitated countless forms of life. How wondrous it all is, each part, a dragonfly, a tree, a bird, a whale, the sunrise, millions of tons of water magically floating through the sky in the form of spellbindingly beautiful clouds bringing life-giving rain. When I witness the destruction of this miraculous web of life, I can only think of returning to the front line of the battle to sound the alarm. Reaching a critical mass of awareness in the population is the only way forward in this fight. The challenges we face are immense. The odds are against us. But as the proverb goes, it's not over till it's over. Any one of us could be the final pebble that triggers the landslide of awakening.
Okay, there you have it. You cannot not care anymore because it's coming to your neighborhood soon. If not, not now, uh, sooner or later, you'll, you'll feel the effects. So uh, I just feel myself, if it's do or die, you know, you got to do something here because it's overwhelming the, the effort these controllers are putting into killing people, you know, from all, all angles, from the geoengineering of the weather to uh, the COVID pandemic to 5G to all the nanos they're putting in the food and the soil, etc. Uh, it's, it's just overwhelming. So again, this was the dimming put out by Dane Wigington from geoengineeringwatch.org. It's on his website if you want to look, look at it again. I uh, suggest you, you do because there's a lot of information here if you want data. Now, he did mention at the end here, it's about uh, awareness. So even more so than data, it's awareness, becoming more aware because that way you can see the bigger picture. The data is a one dimensional literal view, which is, also, which is good, but awareness will give you better survival in terms of the bigger picture of what's going on because there's so much more. There's always something behind what's going on, the surface world. Okay, any comments on that, Kevin? Well, I was uh, watching a, a series on Netflix the other day. Yeah, I think it was, uh, its title was Overall Out Studios, and it depicted a number of uh, short um, mini movies, I suppose. Uh, some of them were 10 minutes, 20 minutes. And it was, uh, they were rather depicting all sorts of various themes and ideas. And some of them were also including very possible potentialities that the human race might be experiencing as well. And the very first episode they had, I don't remember the name of it, but it had Sigourney Weaver starring in it. And it showed a future situation in which the human race had been invaded by a species of alien and they had been completely subjugated, decimated, a huge depopulation event had taken place. There were very few human survivors remaining and uh, these aliens had established themselves and also part of their agenda was uh, bioengineering the weather so it was more suitable for their own requirements because uh, they created these huge stacks, as they called it in the movie, which were producing all these toxic, what would be toxic chemicals for humans, but were, of, were that which they required to breathe. And so, um, and so in regards to the geoengineering that's going on now, yes, it is about depopulation, but it also does seem that they are also altering the atmosphere as well to uh, possibly suit certain species of aliens that may very well make their presence known and actually uh, have a physical presence on the planet if things go that far. Because I've seen a number of real side experiences which depicted scenarios very similar to that episode I just described on Netflix, where as a one future potentiality that after a depopulation event, certain dark force, ill-intended, orientated aliens had invaded, taken over the planet, and were rather, as I said, altering the atmosphere to suit their needs and uh, more or less mining it and plundering its resources for whatever purposes they would have. And so that is another facet of it, I would suggest, that uh, they are altering our atmosphere. Because it does seem a lot of these species, particularly the reptilians, seem to be able to thrive more so in radioactive atmospheres and again this would tie in with all the so-called uh, accidental disasters in regards to the nuclear power stations fukushima etc which as a lot of alternative researchers will tell you are, are anything but accidental and more by design than accident and so i would just add that, that it's a, a big, massive operation, not just for depopulation, but also for 
changing the very conditions on the planet, which will suit more so potential invading species. And obviously then would not suit the uh, human body vehicle that obviously wouldn't be able to survive in such conditions. So I would add that, I would say. Yeah, it's, they're terraforming the planet to suit their own uh, body types. And that's, you know, maybe it makes sense to them that this, this attitude of destruction going on doesn't really make sense because everybody could support each other, no matter the body type. Still, people, aliens, whatever body type you have, it could be so that we each support each other. So it seems to be the attitude, again, destruction all over the creation worlds. But again, it doesn't have to be. We can do make other decisions that are more beneficial for creation and for ourselves. But that's a big, huge process. And it takes a lot of agreement. But it starts with each one of us. So we can each do our part. And let's see what happens. Go ahead, Kevin. The following information was sourced from Science Daily, dated November the 2nd, 2021. Women exposed to smoke from landscape fires during a pregnancy are more likely to give birth to babies with a low or very low birth weights, according to findings published in eLife. The study is the first to report a link between low birth weight and exposure to fire smoke in low and middle income countries where 90% of low birth weight infants are born and landscape fires are prevalent. Landscape fires such as wildfires, tropical deforestation fires and agricultural biomass burning play an important role in maintaining terrestrial ecosystems. Yet, landscape fire smoke is a triggering a costly and growing global public health problem, causing recurrent episodes of pollution, mostly affecting low- and middle-income countries. Previous studies have shown that exposure to fire smoke during a pregnancy is linked to low birth weight, which itself is a public health problem in low to middle income countries. Babies with low birth weights are at higher risk of a range of diseases in a later life compared to normal weight newborns, explains co-first author Jia Jiang Hui Li, a PhD student at the Institute of Reproductive and Child Health School of a Public Health Science Centre, Peking University, China. Several studies have shown the effects of landscape fire smoke on acute lung and heart conditions, but the health impacts of these pollutants on susceptible pregnant women are not well known. We wanted to explore the association between birth weight and exposure to fire source pollution across several countries and over 
a long time period. The researchers conducted a case control study in 54 low to middle income countries where they matched 108,137 groups of siblings to their mothers. They used surveys conducted by the US Agency for International Development between 2000 and 2014 to find out information about sibling birth weights and other health and demographic factors. They then assessed exposure to landscape fire pollutants using data on fire emissions from the Global Fire Emission Database and a model that converted this data into a ground surface concentrations of particulate matter in different regions. Their analysis showed that an increase in exposure of one microgram per cubic meter of a fire sourced particulate matter was associated with a 2.17 gram reduction in birth weight. The effect was even more pronounced when we looked at whether exposure to fire smoke was linked to low or very low birth weight. For every microgram per cubic meter increase in a particulate matter exposure, the risks of low and very low birth weight increased by around 3 and 12 percent respectively, says co-first author Tian Jia Guan, an assistant professor at the Department of Health Policy, School of Health Policy and Management, Chinese Academy of Medical Sciences, and Peking Union Medical College, China. The researchers found that very low birth weight was most strongly linked to the pollution. To find out why, they developed a model that looked at the average birth weights of infants within single families. Newborns in families that had lower birth weights on average were more susceptible to the risks of fire smoke pollution than those who had moderate baseline birth weights. This suggests that other factors affecting maternal and fetal health, such as nutrition or maternal employment status, might make mothers and their developing infants even more susceptible to the risks of pollution, says co-first author Quian Guo, a PhD student at the School of Energy and Environmental Engineering, University of Science and Technology, China. Our global sibling matched study has identified a link between exposure in a pregnancy to landscape fire pollution and reduced birth weight in low and middle income countries, concludes senior author Tao Zui, assistant professor at the Institute of Reproductive and Child Health, 
School of a Public Health Science Center, Peking University, newborns from families where lower birth weights were more common were the most susceptible. It is essential to develop steps that reduce the frequency of landscape fires, to protect maternal and infant health in these vulnerable populations. Yeah, so these fires are carrying the pollutants, obviously. They're transmitters for all these nanos and all this, all this garbage that's in the air. And um, I see that people are basically indoctrinated into this reality of TV, media. I mean, all through these years, they've been listening to that. And if it's not on TV, it's not true. I mean, they're, they're seeing that they, they've programmed people to the point where if it's not on TV, it's not true. So all these other scientists, data, conspiracy theorists, I mean, it doesn't mean that much to a lot of people, if anything, because it's not TV. It's not mainstream narrative. And that's how well they program people to see things a certain way. It's, it's very interesting how this has been going on for many, many years, not by accident, purposely programming people to see things, to perceive things a certain way, even though it's right in front of their face. It's not only the data, but looking up into the air, you know, the sky and seeing chemtrails or looking uh, to see something that's right in front of them and, and thinking it's something else. I mean, that's how good these controllers have done to program people. So this is just one example. Yeah, of, of the smoke and, and the, the uh, damage it's doing to pregnant mothers and potential, you know, the births and, the, and all that. So it's, it's very, what can you say? It's happening. Thank you. The following information was sourced from ABC Science by Zoe Keen, posted Saturday the 13th of November 2021, titled Amazon Deforestation is Stopping a Forest from Recycling Rainwater which affects temperatures. For 55 million years, heavy rain has brought life and splendor to the Amazon rainforest. But a rapid increase in deforestation is threatening the very water systems that make the forest a rainforest. The destruction of the Amazon threatens water security, both in the rainforest itself and further south in more temperate climes. In the week leading up to the COP26 climate summit in Glasgow, Brazil surprised many observers by joining an international pledge to halt and reverse deforestation by 2030. Despite South America's dependence on the rainforest for water, there was a 34% increase in deforestation of the Brazilian Amazon in 2019 compared to 2018 when an estimated 10,129 square kilometers was clear cut. Forests make clouds which in turn creates rain 
explains Amazon expert Bill Lawrence of James Cook University. The Amazon rainforest is large enough to cover about three quarters of the Australian mainland and Professor Lawrence says its sheer size allows it to have a profound impact on the world's weather. The dark forest absorbs energy from the sun and becomes a giant heat and water engine, Professor Lawrence says. Hot, moist air moves high up into the stratosphere and then that moist air goes polewood until it gets to the middle latitudes. Much of the rain falling in southern parts of Brazil and South America, including Brazil's most populous city, Sao Paulo, begins its journey in the Amazon. How do forests make rain? When it rains, trees capture the water with their roots. During photosynthesis, this water is moved up the plant and released into the air via pores on the leaves. This process is called evapotranspiration. Each tree in the forest behaves like a giant fountain, moving large amounts of water from the soil to the air. You can see this in action when a forest appears to steam and clouds rise from the canopy. There are billions of trees in the Amazon and each one is pouring water into the air, creating clouds that eventually fall again as rain. The rainforest's water originally evaporates off the Atlantic Ocean. Much of this water is kept in the system by the trees recycling it. On average, a drop of water gets sucked up six times as it travels across South America from the Atlantic Ocean to the Andes, Professor Lawrence says. Deforestation stops this cycling in its tracks. Extensive deforestation in the tropics can reduce rainfall in a region by up to 40%. In Brazil, the rainforest is being replaced by soy fields and cattle pastures. These landscapes do not cycle water like rainforests. Fields are less complex, with fewer plants and a lower biomass. This means there are not so many leaves pumping water back into the air, Professor Lawrence explains. If you imagine a rainforest, then imagine measuring every single leaf in that rainforest and then compare that measurement to the leaves on a cattle pasture. It's just a tiny fraction. If deforestation continues, the Amazon will reach a tipping point whereby the rainforest will not be able to produce enough rain to keep itself alive and it will become a savanna.
Professor Lawrence warns. In 2018, researchers have published a cautionary letter in Science Advances, writing that with the combined effect of deforestation, fire and changing a climate, it may only take 20 to 25 percent deforestation to transform the east, southern and central Amazon rainforest into a savanna. We are edging close to this tipping point. In 2019, the World Wildlife Fund reported that 17% of the Amazon had been deforested in the past 50 years. Deforestation also reduces rainfall in Australia, according to Clive McAlpine from the University of Queensland. Historical clearing has caused local climates to increase by up to 2 degrees Celsius, Professor McAlpine says. This has been paired with declines in rainfall of up to 15 to 20 percent. We are losing that cycling function of our deep-rooted trees, he says. Not all the water pumped into the air by Amazonian trees falls back on the rainforest. A percentage of the water is carried away and falls in temperate regions south of the rainforest, explains Philip Fearnside, a biologist at Brazil's National Institute of Amazonian Research. A tremendous amount of water is transported by these so-called flying rivers and winds that circle around through the Amazon and go south towards Sao Paulo, Professor Fearnside says. During the rainy season in Sao Paulo, about 70% of the water is coming from the Amazon, and that's when you need to fill the reservoirs. The city of Sao Paulo has come close to running out of water several times, and that's without destroying the Amazon rainforest, which makes it much more likely you'd have a major catastrophe. Professors Fearnside and Lawrence are among the many researchers and commentators who lay the blame for Brazil's recent spike in deforestation at the feet of President Jair Bolsonaro, who came to power in Brazil in 2018. Bolsonaro has been pushing for new roads into the Amazon, which always create a Pandora's box ranging from deforestation, poaching, illegal mining, illegal logging, illegal land colonisation, a lot of illegal burning for charcoal, among other things, Professor Lawrence says. Professor Fearnside adds, you have a projection that Sao Paulo is going to be out of water. That's a very drastic thing. It's much more convenient 
to just deny it. The reflex to deny a major catastrophe is very attractive. Thanks. It's very interesting about the evapo, evapo trans, trans, uh, portation or trans, uh, when the water goes up from the plants and leaves and stuff and forms into the atmosphere, uh, it creates uh, climate. I've seen that in documentaries in the uh, green belts in Africa where they plant trees and it creates an atmosphere basically where it was desert and then from the tree planting, it creates like a rain and a whole different uh, type of topography, uh, biosphere. Eco ecology, you know, by planting trees and having having that um, that process going on. So it's very interesting. And then the other thing, uh, like we saw in Geoengineering Watch, the scientists that are studying these things, I mean, some of them are focused, they're compartmentalized, so they're focusing on one thing, and particularly if they have grants from agencies that want to promote certain types of uh, information and market certain ideas, well, they're just gonna focus on one thing. And we see like in the uh, geoengineering documentary where EPA just focuses on, on certain size of the particulates in the atmosphere and it disregards the smaller ones, the nanos, which are really the, the dangerous ones. So they're just measuring a certain size of the particulates in the atmosphere and that seemingly is fine, everything looks fine. So that's what they report to the people. Whereas really, if they measured the nanoparticles, you'd see a whole different picture of what's going on. A lot of poisons there and we're breathing it. So again, the science, you know, when people say follow the science, well, that's, you really got to more follow the money, follow the grants, follow, follow the mainstream narrative. And uh, there's a lot more to it. So again, use your awareness rather than just the data and science. There's an awareness component here that makes more sense. New you, you, you. New you. That was the World Forest Report. See you next week.